Baruch Hashem. It says that in the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. Amen? Um, how would you describe the, the fullness of joy? What, is that, what does that feel like? Total peace. Okay, total peace. What else? Total okay, total completeness, yeah. Um, and, and we experience that in just like little snippets. Maybe it's for five minutes, maybe it's for an hour, uh, maybe, it's, maybe we're not even aware of it. Uh, and, and we really can't necessarily describe the experience to somebody any more than we can describe the taste of vanilla. But you've tasted vanilla, you know what it tastes like. And so this peace is, is again, we don't strive for the peace, we strive for the wholeness and the completeness of what it means to be and become transformed into the likeness that we've lost and we're now on this journey of recovering it. The light of Messiah, when we speak of the light of Messiah, what does that mean? What else? Revelation. All right. Full understanding. All right. Full understanding. Yes. What else? Knowledge and the wisdom of God. Okay. Absolutely. The knowledge and the wisdom. Um, as believers, we understand that He is the source of light. Um, he is the Creator. Of course, He has illumined us with the sun, which gives us the light. Uh, he has given us the moon, by which um, is the moon um, anything of itself, or is it just a bunch of dead dust? crammed together into a ball. What makes the moon beautiful? It reflects the light. And God, he gives us so many of these pictures on how to be able to understand. Um, we are nothing without God. We are just a bunch of dead dust compacted together. But in and through the light of God, we become beautiful and luminous. And that is what we were, we were created to become. Um, Adam and Eve had this in the garden, if you can imagine. And when they sinned, they broke that connection with God. And, and his glory, his, his light departed from them. Can you imagine uh, being warm and comfortable and happy? It's hard to imagine sometimes, but happy. And all of a sudden, in one instant, doors open up and you're pushed out into the Arctic cold with no clothes on. You feel exposed and cold and alone. And that's likely what it felt like for our, our mother Eve and our father Adam when they broke the communion with God. Everything they'd known was suddenly severed and they had not not the light and the warmth. And so this is, again, the journey that we're on is recovering the likeness of God. And what is the likeness of God? What are some, some attributes or qualities? Love. Humility. Okay, humility. Nice. Guys, guys got in, in unison there. Compassion? Yep. Um, what's that one that's super hard? Forgiveness. Uh-huh. Forgiveness? Patience. Oh, patience. I'm thinking of another one. I mean, maybe they're all really hard. I don't know. Mercy. Mercy. And so we're on this journey of recovering this. The, and the only way that we do it is, is the gradual process You've heard it called sanctification. It's also called illumination. It's this that we are actively or not a part of. He says, Messiah does, I am the light of the world. Ironically, then just a little bit later, he also says what? You are the light of the world. Like Israel at the time of Messiah, who at some moments cried out, Hosanna to the son of David and they waved palm branches like they should have done, and they laid down their cloaks in front of the king just like they should have done. But something, and only a handful, seemed to have gotten what was there. They went through the motions of recognizing the king, but their lives didn't follow suit afterwards. And only a small remnant, as small as it was at the time, of those that gathered at the cross, who were the three? Okay, the apostle, John, Miriam, who is his mother, and Miriam of Magdala, three, gathered at the cross and did not forsake him. It's a pretty small remnant. And yet, from the faith of those three, he redeemed the apostles that had fled from him. He redeemed the disciples and the others who were not named among the twelve, who, who fled from him, and then who 
came together once again in that upper room. And so he says, I am the light of the world. And because the, the world needs light, the darkness, what is the darkness? Okay, Satan, what else? Okay, the absence of God, yes. Uh, the darkness, darkness in the hearts of human beings. What, what is that? Disconnection from God or separation from God. Yep. Okay, so we become believers. Um, we experience that reconnection, uh, the, um, this um, reestablishing of our ability to commune with God. Um, and so are we immediately illumined and without darkness at that point? No, because we still have will. Yep. Um, so the apostle says, I war against the old man, the, our old nature. Do you have the old nature still? Because I sure do. And that old nature has to be constantly struggled against. Is our journey a struggle? Yeah. Oh, you better believe it. If anybody told you it wasn't a struggle, they sold you a bill of, of goods that has no value. This life has been given to us for repentance. It is a journey. Can you imagine uh, if you uh, told your, um, a friend or maybe a spouse, hey, what do you want me to say I'm sorry for? I said it to you 40 years ago. How far would that go? Not far. Repentance, asking for forgiveness, it's an everyday thing because God is perfect and we are not. And this journey is something that we find ourselves on. If you would please turn over to John, the Gospel, chapter 8, in verse 12. Um, we constantly revisit certain things amongst which light is found. Why do we need to revisit the, the various things? What's that? Uh, what happens when you're asleep and you wake up in the morning? Outside of feeling like, oh my God, what's happening? Uh, what, what is caked around our eyes? Sleep, the stuff that's, you gotta wipe, gotta, gotta wipe the eyes off, gotta wash the face, you gotta, you have to reawaken yourself because you've been asleep. And many times we find ourselves in this state Oh, God, I don't remember the last time I called out to you or prayed to you. Or, God, I don't, I don't remember. Or, uh, Father, I've been so busy with my work or, or this that I... Splash off the face, wash off the face. And we begin again to ask for this light. John chapter 8 and verse 12. And Yeshua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of the or is it the, the light of life? Not walk in darkness. What does that mean? Disbelief. Okay. Disbelief is darkness. Walking separated from God. Okay. Uh, walking separated from God. Not, not um, the is the light. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this darkness, we, we speak of walking in darkness, is, is what? Okay. You can't see what you're about to fall into. Right. If we were to flip off that light switch, um, you would probably be disoriented really quickly. Because this, this room is built for a theater, which means it's blacked out, except for a little bit of light maybe back there. Pitch black. Uh, I do it every Saturday when I, I'm trying to lock up and leave. I have to use my phone light, because I'm not smart enough to have a, a flashlight apparently on me. <laughs> do you know how far that, that flashlight um, lumens in front of me in that Thick darkness. Eh. And so I'm praying every Saturday as I exit out that door that I don't trip over something again. Because my light isn't strong enough to show far enough ahead of me. And so I either need a stronger light or I need to walk slowly and patiently. And our journey is like this. We only have so much light right now. We've only been given this light, whatever it is, whatever it is for you or for me. And we have to be striving for those that are constantly seeking a greater illumination. 
Not so that we can go, hey, look at me, I'm illumined. As soon as we do that, what, what happens? Pride, which is a killer of all things beautiful and all things holy. Suddenly, when we say, oh, look, I'm illumined, a little dimmer switch goes, it's turned down. What? I'm illumined. No, we have to be those that we don't pay attention to the level of illumination of our hearts. We, we only seek to have more of God. Is there ever truly enough of God that we can have? Uh, if you were to stand uh, five feet from the sun right now, what would happen to you? Assuming you could get five feet, of course. Uh, the sun's pretty warm down here, I want to say. Thank you, God, uh, as, as we enter into July and August. I, I'm not ready. I, I, I can't withstand that. I, I need to be more prepared to be able to be in the presence of God. He says, but have the light of life. What does it mean for us as believers to have the light of life? Okay, his breath of life that we can live. What else? Change from our old self to new. Okay, a, a transformation from our old self into our new self. There's so much in my mind. It's the idea that this life is not the life that we're trying to live. This life is a stepping stone into eternal life. Yeah. Whether it's with him or apart from him. And that light of life is the revelation of getting his true life. Not just this life. What does God's life look like in us? Patience. Love. Okay. All right. Being patient. Um, it, it's the virtues of God ever growing and ever shining out in our lives. Mm -hmm. and, and, and our love towards God and our love towards our fellow man. Okay. The virtues are like muscles. Um, did some trimming in the yard recently and discovered that I had a few. Uh, virtues that weren't, hadn't been used in a while. And man was I sore afterwards. Um, how do we exercise patience and exercise love and compassion? Um, when you're in the gym working out, um, are you lifting it, those weights because it's easy? Or because you desire a, a result? You desire something, you desire strength. Um, maybe if you're younger, you desire bigger muscles. For most of us, we would desire it so that we're simply healthier. <coughs> the virtues make us healthy, and they make us whole, and they, as, as we grow in them, then we become more complete. When he says, I, I desire that you reach the stature of the fullness of Messiah, what does the apostle mean by that? Stature of the fullness of Messiah. What's that? Knowledge. Okay, knowledge. What Christ was as he walked on earth as a man, so God desires that we in our life become like him and become more to, to see his grace, to see his mercy, to, to experience the, the power of his life Okay. Good. Um, it's 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 as it's we become authentic moons reflecting the light. Uh, we become something greater than than we have the capacity to be on our, by ourselves. Uh, a couple chapters over to chapter twelve. The apostle John is the most um, transcendent of all the apostles. He writes of, of very deep things with ordinary words. He he. He, he imbues just normal words with, with very deep meanings. And it's because he, personally, being found as one of the three that stood at the cross, I, his love for Messiah, he was granted a, a very special revelation. We see that in chapter 12 and verse 46. <clears throat> he says, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me shall not abide, live, dwell in darkness. What does that mean? If we are in him, then we do not live or abide in darkness. 
What does it mean to abide in darkness or live? Okay, to live away from his presence. To walk in a pool of muddy passions and darkness. Okay. Uh, the, the passions are, are the, the distortions of the virtues. They are the, the brokenness of our humanity, uh, which we war against. Uh, and so if we abide in darkness, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Okay. And we as believers have a peace inside that though we are in the world, we are not as the scripture says of this world because we have the light connection to God. Okay. So as believers we we do we also struggle against the darkness? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the world walks around as blind. And you and I walk around sometimes with like one eye one hand over our eye. Um, who put my hand there? I did. I chose to put my hand there. And this is how we are at times when we choose against loving, against being compassionate and merciful. Uh, building the virtues, instead we, we go, and sometimes it's even worse. And sometimes it's as if I had four hands because I do this and I also do this at the same time. Who can, who can reach me? Nobody, only by God's mercy. We have to be those that do, are not content in walking in darkness. I remember a time when I walked in darkness. And it was the, one of the most unhappy times of my life because I chose that path. And in that time, it was so lonely because the God that I knew felt so far away. But in his mercy, he let me fall to the bottom so that I could claw my way to the top once more, so that I would have an appreciation for his gifts and his mercy that he has given so generously my whole life. And when you have tasted the light and you've fallen away, there is no, no one so unhappy as a fallen believer. The world doesn't know what, what it, it might have tasted, but when we fall, as believers, we have tasted the light, and we have to, by His grace, and grace is what? The power to accomplish His will. It's, his, it's his, what He gives to us to be able to accomplish this. So we have to, by His grace, return once again to the righteous path. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 8. So, um, as a believer, uh, can I uh, wander off the path right now? Yes. Um, and what, what are some, some things that, that I might experience if I were to wander off the, the straight path? Sadness. Sadness. Amen. What else? Temptation. Yep. Temptation. What else? What are some other things? Um, so, uh, you like ice cream? It's a good thing because we've got a lot of it out there. Um, what happens if you were to take uh, two gallons of ice cream and sit down and eat the whole thing? It would taste good. Yeah. <laughs> for, for that minute or... Um, and so ice cream is like the good things that God gives to us. But we take that and we distort it by overindulging. Um, we, we take it and we, we show our disdain for God by abusing that which he's given to us. Something that is, for the most part, good. We take those things and that's, again, a way that we have to constantly be looking at sight. No one can see your heart except for God. No one can see my heart except our Father. You have to be looking at your heart and I have to be looking at mine in the light of Messiah, so that I can see what still remains. He says in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the, spirit of, sorry, the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. 
finding out what is acceptable to the Lord, and having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. So the unfruitful works of darkness, what does, what should we be having and demonstrating? Not the unfruitful works of darkness, but the fruitful works of the light, which is what? Of peace and joy and patience. It's so hard sometimes. Kindness. What is kindness? Driving traffic without making a comment. Wow. That's impossible. I mean, the, the Lord works in mysterious ways. Yes, truly. Uh, at the root of all darkness and at all of the passions, there's one thing. Selfishness. Selfishness. I think everything should be my way. Because right, I mean, isn't that what our marketing uh, consciously shoved down our throat? You deserve this. You deserve the finest of all things. Don't let anybody keep you from, from what you deserve. I deserve a lightning bolt right now because of my wickedness. And yet, by his mercy, he hasn't because he is love. And he never desires the destruction of a human being, but that we would turn. Are you, you love your children, right? We're disappointed sometimes. Do we ever stop loving them? No, never. God loves you and I in such a perfect way that no matter what you do, he's always there cheering you to come forward. He's like the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. He wasn't just hanging out in his house going, yeah, it's such a good life here. I got everything I need. Yeah, that kid will return someday. No, he was outside looking, watching, preparing, waiting. And then he just didn't go, oh, yeah, there he is. And I'm going to tell him I told him so. He runs for that child. He runs for the one who had defiled himself in all ways possible. And he didn't condemn him and say, yeah, I told you this was going to happen. He said, my son has returned. Let's make a feast. Our God rejoices over you and me whenever we fall, even as believers, and we rise and get up again. He rejoices. And the angels rejoice. Your guardian angel who watches over you every minute of every day is if we could hear them singing over us we would never ever want to hear them cry over us again. They are the servants of God who watch over us. He says, walk as children of the light. It, it, it's not easy. It takes a commitment to a true life, not a half-hearted life, not a mediocre life, which is so common in our country today, but a passionate life lived for and growing progressively in this journey. He gives us this light upon our acceptance and uh, our acknowledgement of him through baptism, the reception of the Spirit of God. He gives us this light. What doesn't change when we become believers? What do we still have? Free will to choose. Um, God doesn't want robots. He wants passionate beings that are living to, to become like him and serve him. And the holy angels, which have remained faithful, they had a choice to, to turn from God. And a third of them did. And now they live in misery and wretchedness and bitterness. And they want you and I to become like them. The holy angels, which are, are st steadfast and peaceful, uh, they're not statues that never... They sing, right? When, 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 it, when, when creation happened, the angels, they sang and they rejoice. They're not just st st statues that do whatever God says. They have personalities and the ability to choose and they have remained faithful. And we are called to be something greater than the angels. 
He says we're created a little bit lower than them. They are our, like our, our guardians, our, our elder brothers. And they're there to help us to return to our birthright, which they don't have. But they're glad to do the will of God and to be those that have guided us along by his will. Chapter 11 of Luke. Chapter 11 in Luke, verse 34. It says, The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Where does sin begin? It it begins somewhere in there. The mind, um, we desire something. And sin then proceeds into the mind in which we have a choice at that point. Take every thought captive, says the apostle. Pray without ceasing, he says. When we are faced with this temptation to become or to act in a way that is contrary, um, the Lord is my light and my salvation, and whom shall I? We have to be able to push the thought out of our minds. What happens if we dwell on that thought? The apostle says it begins and then it grows and then it bears, it gives birth to death. He says, turn from the unfruitful works of darkness. The eye, why is the eye so important? Yep, that's right. It's the eye is so, so powerful. Um, the, the eyes, um, as we age, um, this body becomes different. But the eyes remain who we are. And as that person that you love grows older and you see their eyes, you see them. And that person will be what you see in, in, in their eyes on the other side of the veil in a form and in a way that doesn't ever has to hurt again and is never suffering, the eyes. And that's why we have to guard our eyes. And it's why this world is is bombarding us with the affliction of video everything. Boom, boom, boom. Because if it can control our minds through that, then we don't have the ability to think. We have to guard our eyes. We tell our children, be careful what you see. Be careful what you hear. Be careful what you say. It's true. We have to be those that fill our minds and our our eyes with good things. What's the most beautiful thing outside of perhaps your loved ones that you enjoy looking at? Most beautiful thing. Who? Somebody. Sunset. The sunset. What's that? Nature. Okay, nature. The The beach. Ah. We we look at, at the creation of God, which is so beautiful. We, if you've been to the beach and you're, you can, you're probably hearing the sounds of the ocean right now, and maybe the sun setting, or, or maybe you enjoy the morning time when the sun rises, and, and the smell of the beach, for the most part, is good. It, it's, it's the beautiful thing that God has created. Um, what don't you enjoy looking at? Traffic, that's right. Good, good call. Yep. Uh, garbage. garbage. A carcass. Okay. Something that's dead. Yeah, it's not so great. We have to be those that, are, that reject darkness and the things that are of the world and fill our minds and our hearts with good things. He says about whatsoever is good, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is beautiful, whatsoever is of a good report. What happens when we fill our minds and our hearts with gossip? What does it do to us? We become a gossip. Okay, we become a gossip. What else? It corrupts you from the inside. That's right. It's like swallowing poison, going, man, this is so good. I want to share it with you. Here, let me put the poison in your mouth too, or in your ears. Evil things corrupt us. 
it's like um, grabbing a bunch of sulfur and swallowing it and then taking the sulfur. Do you know what sulfur smells like? Okay, good. Rotten eggs. And then saying to somebody else, hey, you've got to taste this. God have mercy on me, a sinner. We have to be those that, that reject that and that don't take it. Um, if we take unhealthy things in, uh, it, it makes us unhealthy. It's, my, my parents used to say it, and garbage in, garbage out. It's super simple. Um, if you eat Taco Bell for an entire month, three meals a day, sorry, Gabriel, there's a, there, there, there's a, uh, yeah. yes, yes, yes. I, God, you can, all, you can all read between the lines there. Yep. There is a price to pay. What we take in, it has to come out. He says in uh, Luke chapter 35, sorry, 11, rather, in, in verse 35, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Well, that's interesting. For if your whole body is full of light, having no dark part, the whole body will be full of light. Then the bright shining of a lamp, uh, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. That seems a bit contrary. What, to, what does he mean by that? It's, um, and the sci-fi fans out there will appreciate this, um, it's like dark matter. It's as if there was a light that was dark that shines. Um, it has an effect, just like light does. I mean, I, every Saturday I'm, I'm here in the light. If that was darkness bombarding me, I, I, I absorb the light. I also absorb darkness. We have to be those that do not have that within us. If you have a sickness within you, what do you have to do in the natural? What's that? Okay, I have to get healed. Um, you have to get it out of you, right? Um, you, you've all heard of, of detoxing. Uh, we're constantly those that are mindful that we need to detox from the world. So we see that this has to be, again, part of the process. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 19. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. But he who comes to the truth comes to the light, so that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. What was the first action of our, our, our father Adam and our mother Eve when they sinned? What was their first inclination? Okay, to cover themselves and hide. At some point, the world just doesn't care anymore or has no discernment of what is evil and what is good and just simply lives and does and fumbles and stumbles and wounds and mars and destroys, vandalizes. Even the image 
because they have not yet begun to acquire the likeness of God. And we, as believers, have to be those that are, are mindful of what we're doing. What is sin? It's not breaking the rules. Sin is what? The destruction of the, of, of the beautiful thing of in, that is inside us. Uh, it, it's, the rules are there so that we don't. Uh, if you tell a child, don't touch the hot oven or the stove, the rule is there to keep the child from doing the action. But the action that happens is that the child places their hand upon the hot stove and it burns the flesh and, and mars it. And that's what sin is. It's not breaking the rule. It's destroying the beautiful thing that God has given. Repentance is the medicine that restores us and helps us to heal. It's the vitamins. It's, it's, the, it's the nutrients. It's the, uh, it's the beautiful whole grain foods that heal us is like repentance. And so that's where we have to be those that are mindful of what it is that we're doing. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness more than the light. Why do you think anybody would speak poorly of Jesus? Bless you. How could anybody look upon the teacher and hate him? What, what are some ways that they might do that and why? What else? Why would somebody blaspheme the king? Because he is the authority. He is the rule. He is the all in all. And that is contrary to the I, the me, the selfishness. Okay. Uh, that's right. It's, it's a matter of control. What else? Why, why would somebody else, why would somebody disparage? Jealousy. Okay. And what, what would they be jealous of, of, of him? If God is everything, then everything. Jealousy. Following him as opposed to following him. Okay. Jealousy is, 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 is the point at which we recognize the root of rebellion against God, right? Who was jealous in the beginning? Who had everything? Who shone with the glory of God? Who was created among the most beautiful? and was, it says, the most beautiful creation. He had everything, but he was jealous and he desired more. And isn't that the philosophy of, of, of our age, of this world? Oh, you've, you've achieved so much. That's really great. Oh, but look, you need, to, you need to go here. Oh, wait. Oh, look, you need this. Oh, hey, if you just get that, you're going to be happy. And you get it. Oh, wait, did we, did we say that? Oh, wait, wait, wait. And if you call in the next 10 minutes? That's right. <laughs> There's so much more. It's, it's the carrot and we're the donkey. It's not good. We have to be those that, that step off of the path of the world on the righteous path. The carrot, as, as if it, it actually were, is eternal life. A glorious and luminous and, and amazing being in the presence of God forever. Temporary little cotton candy joy here on earth, and then misery. I want the righteous path. I desire the righteous path. Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 12. The apostle says, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Armor of light. What are the works of darkness? Which are normal for the world. If you were to say this to the world, they'd be like, what? That's just my everyday life, man. What are the works of darkness? Drugs. Drugs. Anger. Anger. What's that? Hatred. Hatred, yeah. Envy, revenge. Addiction. 
Addictions, yeah. It's, what else? What are some other works of darkness? Selfishness. Yeah. It's just normal. Uh, Abba Anthony says that in the end times, uh, that um, a righteous person will, will be present and people will begin to attack him because they have gone insane. And they'll attack this person who is not like them, saying, you're insane, you're not like us. Good will be evil and evil will be good. Light will be dark. Aren't all the heroes of our modern day dark? They kind of do whatever they have to do to get done. Long gone is the honorable hero, the one who abided by a code that he did not compromise. That, that looked upon as pff, Boy Scouts. Uh, you're, no, our, our heroes are do whatever it takes. Accomplish your goal is all that matters. And I tell you, as the scripture does, how you get there matters just as much as getting there. You can achieve all things, but if we have lied and we have stolen and we have deceived, then we have built upon a foundation of sand. If we have anything, and it's why many times the righteous have little, because it's less important to them than achieving things in this life, in this world. They have put their hand to that which is eternal. Prophets they ended up with pretty much nothing. And what happened to them at the end? They all died. Uh, the apostles, save John, were failures by our contemporary modern American Christian society, which says, you've got to have everything. Be, have everything. Wealth, health, wealth, and everything. And the apostles laid down their lives and bled into the earth so that the seed of their bearing witness would give rise to fruit which is and has been eternal. They planted their blood into the earth so that you and I, centuries, thousands of years later, would be able to benefit from their faith. And the disciples of those apostles who picked up the banner, and many of them also bled. And so it has come down to us today. We have to be those that are not comfortable. And if you don't know, if you're sitting in mud, it's pretty comfortable, right? It's kind of squishy. But suddenly you realize, oh, uh, this mud's getting kind of cold. And when it was warm, it was okay, but it's getting kind of cold now. And you start to go, oh, this doesn't feel good. You have two choices. Maybe three, but we'll go with two. You can stay there. What happens when, when the mud gets cold? And then you're stuck. Or two, you can arise and come out of it. And then, do you go put on clean clothes? Oh man, I'm going inside for a warm shower, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pressure washer, right? If your wife will let you in. Honey. No, do you go through the process of cleansing the mud off of you so that you don't track it everywhere? And where we walk, we either bring the fragrance of God or the mud and the muck and the schmutz of sin. It's a process. We're, we're not there yet. We're still in this, in, this, in this journey. Matthew chapter 5. We'll finish here. Matthew chapter 5. And verse 14. He says, sort of contrastingly, but yet in unison with his earlier term, he says, I am the light of the world. But now he says, you are the light of the world. What? Is he just kind of like going, eh, all right, it's yours now. What does he mean by you are the light of the world? Okay. I am the light, and I just live your life. Yep. You are a creature of, of earth, of dust, of, that is dissolving. I am. And yet, we bear within us the incomprehensible, glorious presence of God. A little light each of us has. When we come into a place like this, it's like gathering a whole bunch of candles. And if I was better prepared, I would have brought us a whole bunch of candles 
for a picture of what it looks like. We gather together each week and we bring this light, whatever light we have together, and it illumines and shines and it's, it's beautiful here. And then we, it, it's like our juice gets turned up in that light bulb and it gets a little bit brighter. And we walk out of this, this place and we walk into the world or back to our homes or wherever it is and we're a little brighter than we were before we came. Why? Not because any of us, one of us is awesome, but because Christ is in our midst. And we bring the lights together. And when you bring a whole bunch of lights together, it's a whole lot brighter all around it. And then we go back to our homes and to our places of work, and we take that with us. As the light has shone into the darkness, and the darkness doesn't understand it and can't conquer it. Your light cannot be taken from you. You have to give it up or allow it to go brighter. The light which you and I have been given and gifted, what are we going to do with it? Hide it under something like the, the poor servant did? Or take what we have and multiply it? Touching lives and touching hearts and allowing that to share the light with each person around us. And we don't never even necessarily have to say Jesus. We simply give. Maybe it's a listening ear. Maybe it's a hug. Maybe it's something simple. God works in simplicity. We only have to be those servants that are faithful and attentive. He says, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. What is a city that's on a hill? Uh, warriors, uh, former soldiers, what's, what's a city on a hill? Major defense. Okay, good defense, yeah. It's, a, it's exposed, it's open on all sides. Yeah, everybody can see it, right? It's transparent. It's there it is. Uh, a city in a cave. Yeah. It's vulnerable. It's present. It's there for a purpose. We can't be those that just hide the light which we have within us. The light or the city, your life is to be a beacon. Martyr, martyrius in Greek. What is a martyr? It's not somebody who dies, although it is. It's, it's a term that, that means to bear witness to the truth. A martyr is somebody who gives their life for the truth. The apostle said, Jesus, we'll die with you. And he said, really? Okay. I don't want you to die for me. I want you to live for me. And then, perhaps, at the appointed time, I may call you to lay down your life and bleed. But I want you to live and bear witness to the truth. In the book of the Revelation, it says that just before the coming of Messiah, that there will be two witnesses who gather in Jerusalem, and they're present there. The witnesses, the word is martyr, because they're bearing witness. They're proclaiming the truth. And yes, at the end of their appointed mission, they are called to lay down their lives and bleed and die. You and I will rarely be called to that type of sacrifice. But our sacrifice today is being kind to those who are not kind to us, loving those who hate us, um, being patient on the roads, being merciful to those that don't deserve it. Have you ever said that? in your mind or out of your, your lips. That person doesn't deserve my forgiveness. And yet, what do we desire from God? Do we not deserve his forgiveness? He says, I'll give it to you. All you have to do is ask. But then he says, says to you and to me, you go and do likewise. You, you go and be me to the world and show them who I am in your everyday actions. Fail, but I'm going to be better tomorrow, T later today, if God gives me the breath. Every day, every breath is an opportunity, and that's the beauty of, of his way. God has called you and I to be those that bear witness into this world, and we should be those that are constantly striving for that. He does this so that you and I can reveal the God who cannot be seen and to clarify the God who has been seen because people have a lot of mis uh, mis um, 
misunderstandings about who Jesus is. They've had this Jesus shoved down their throats that he's this fire and brimstone God, or even perhaps worse, this eh, kind of, eh, we'll do whatever you want, I love you. That's not who he is. Those are both fractured, broken, distorted versions of Jesus. The Jesus who is, is perfect and holy and beautiful. He is the God who is a God of love, but also a God of what? Accountability. Because he is perfect. We pray for God's mercy, not for his justice in our lives. What's his mercy to us? Okay. We don't get what we deserve. That's right. Which is death. And his justice is his justice is that which we, we deserve. He is calling, crying out. Um, the prophets have cried out and are calling out. You and I should be those that cry out for our neighbors, our family members who hate us, or at least hate the one that we serve. And we should be crying out for them. Do you have you wept over them? You've wept, and I have wept because of them, because they've hurt us. But have we wept over them, putting our priesthood into practice and be those that birth them into the kingdom simply through our, our cries and our prayers? This is the way of God. This is the way of Israel. So let's strive today to be even more like the ones that we're called to become. We're surrounded by our family pictures, the prophets, the apostles, and they're calling and they're cheering you and I on right now. And they're saying, finish the race, proceed onwards. We know it's not easy, we know it's hard, but we're waiting for you. And may you and I be those that are faithful until the end. Father, we thank you that you have loved us with an unimaginable love and graciousness of which we can rarely even begin to understand. Help us to begin to appreciate you, to thank you for illuminating us and giving us your peace. May this peace grow and become truly shalom, the wholeness and completeness that you have called us to be. May we do this until our last breath and love you and praise you for all things. In Messiah's name we ask, amen.